The Eastern Sierra is an iconic landscape. It's famous worldwide. It's a high desert environment. There are a lot of different plant communities because of how diverse the landscape is. You're going from a low elevation in Death Valley of below sea level all the way up to the top of Mount Whitney at nearly 15,000 feet. You have forests, you have sagebrush steppe, you have salt deserts, alkali flats. There's a very diverse set of ecosystems in this landscape. We're in Mammoth Lakes right now at the Sierra Nevada Aquatic Research Laboratory, which is part of the Valentine Eastern Sierra Reserves. We're working on a project here. It's the Pinion Community Climate Action Project, or PICA. It's an interdisciplinary community-based research project. And we've been out here this summer with a team of 10 students for the Eastern Sierra Land and Community Survey. We've been out in the community doing interviews, focus groups. We're about to launch a survey and we're trying to better understand how people are using lands in the Eastern Sierra and the different values that are important to them. One set of community that we're working with are people who are indigenous to the regions. There's a large community of people who've called that region their home for a long time. Ranchers, as well as hunters and fishers. Those are the different communities that we're working with. And they are often the communities that experience the first and worst impacts of climate change. We're really interested and focused on building the resilience of pinion juniper woodlands and working with the communities that depend on them. We're tackling this from a sociological perspective, ecological and evolutionary perspective by collecting multiple data that will help us learn what the threats are of PJ woodlands and how we can best support the resilience of these woodlands. Being out there really clears your head, kind of grounds you in a way. I know families go up there individually, but to go up there as a whole community and all of us out there, like how we used to, how we used to go and harvest the pine nuts, go up there and sing and stay up there for camps for days. Pinion pines are really widespread tree species across the Eastern Sierras, but also across the Western US more broadly. They really commonly form lower tree line. They're the trees that you tend to see in the hotter and drier places. They also seem to be really vulnerable to climate change, namely wildfires and drought. Also what makes them really special are the pine nuts that they produce that are really important for a whole wide array of wildlife species that eat their pine seeds every year. And then they're also culturally important for many tribal nations across the Eastern Sierras. Pine trees are really cool because when they develop these cones, they also leave behind this really cool cone scar. And so we can go back in time on a branch and find these cone scars that are distinct from other scars on the branch. And we can then use that to reconstruct what historical cone production is. You have populations across the species range synchronizing. How are they all synchronizing? You have things that are miles away and they're all kind of at the same time producing pine nuts. What are the environmental drivers, the cues that they're picking up on? We've been in the midst of drought for a number of years and we've come out of it intermittently. What's happened is it goes beyond just some temperature changes, some deviance. The real question is, well, what's happening on a catastrophic end? And I think identifying what's really contributing to this astronomical dead and dying condition should really be the primary focus in any effort. Many generations of working families have been on this landscape working to improve the habitat. I think it's important to connect community members across all demographics that are excited and interested in working together to understand more about climate resilience and the effects it has on the landscapes that we love and that we recreate in. People might come in being a little bit kind of skeptical about these outsiders coming in from the Bay Area. We've seen that as soon as people really engage with our team and learn about the project, people realize the benefit that it could bring to the community. We've definitely been lucky to be able to talk with lots of diverse people and get lots of diverse perspectives. Four of our partners are the Bishop Paiute Tribe, the Big Pine Paiute Tribe, Bridgeport Indian Colony, and the Washoe Tribe. There are a lot of ancestral homelands in this region. and We've been working very closely with our tribal partners to help elevate the land stewardship work that they've been doing for a long time. And something that's a defining feature of this landscape is how much federal land there is. Most of the land, upwards of 80% of it in this region, is managed by federal agencies like the U.S. Forest Service and the Bureau of Land Management. So federal land managers are really important in this landscape and also partners on our project as well. We hope that we'll see a whole bunch of different projects grow out of this effort. This is a seed phase project. This is just the beginning. 